I guess I want to start with Syria. Um, you've written that you know folks have the impression that it's winding down, but yeah. in fact, it may even be getting worse. Tell us, give us, sort of untangle it for us. Give us a snapshot of what it looks like to you today. Well, thank you, Jane, for starting with an easy one. So, uh, <laughs> you know, Syria, <laughs> to use the uh, technical diplomatic term, is a mess. Uh, and, uh, and you're right. I mean, if you look at what's going on uh, in, in the Idlib province, which is the northwest part of Syria, you look at East Ghouta, which is a suburb of Damascus, and you see what UN officials are saying about this. This is a humanitarian nightmare uh, where hospitals are being bombed. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe, but not only do the hospitals get bombed, but when they go underground, then bunker busters are used against the hospitals. Uh, and this, by the way, includes the Russians doing it. It's not just the barrel bombs of the, of the Assad regime or some of the Shia militias supporting them. Um, so you have a humanitarian disaster. I mean, let's just put Syria in perspective. A half a million dead, right? More than 500,000 dead. The population of Syria at the beginning of this war was between 22 and 23 million. Close to 12 million people are displaced. Five million people displaced outside the country. Uh, the other seven million displaced in the country living in conditions that are probably impossible to imagine. Uh, a whole generation of kids, uh, probably subject now to post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, low estimates of what it will take to rebuild the country, $300 billion, low estimates. Uh, so now I'm just describing the catastrophic nature uh, of what this conflict has produced. So now let me try to untangle it, because you asked a question that is, right now it looks like a crazy quilt of strange bedfellows. So what's going on in the northern part of the country? So Turkey has, Turkey had already carved out uh, an area of about 5,000 square kilometers already because they, they want to prevent what is a, a contiguous corridor of Kurds below their border. Uh, they've gone into, they're trying to take a city called uh, Afrin uh, and the Russians allowed them, because the Russians control the airspace, allowed them for s at least a period of time to launch uh, bombing missions in addition to what they have with regard to forces on the ground. Now that seems to have stopped because the Russian ally in this conflict is the Assad regime. And the Assad regime has now sent militia forces to come to the aid of the Kurds who are in Afrin. Now, the, we, have, we support the Syrian Democratic Forces that are mostly made up of Kurds in the YPG, the Syrian Protection Forces. The good news is there's not going to be a quiz afterwards, so you don't have to <laughs> repeat this. Uh, but the, uh, we have a presence, a s mostly special forces presence, in the eastern part of Syria uh, with the YPG, who proved to be the most effective fighters against ISIS. Many of those fighters of the YPG wanted to go to their Kurdish brethren in Afrin. Now, they're separated by this area that, the, that Turkey controls. So by having this space that Turkey has created, they have already prevented the ability to create contiguity, or at least a contiguous corridor. But they have emphasized that they were going to threaten an area called Man Beach, which is where we are in a smaller presence. Uh, they don't seem to be doing that now. One of the reasons they're not doing that is because it's turned out to be much tougher to take over Afrin than they thought so far. Uh, but now you have this new wrinkle where the Russian ally is now sending forces there. They apparently were hit by Turkish artillery, so some have shown up, some have stopped their advance. Uh, the Russians have basically told the, the Turks now to stop their, their air operations there. And this is, by the way, this is just the northern part uh, of Turkey. Let's move to the northeast where we have been. Uh, the week before last, 
you had a couple of developments. One was a, a militia, a group of militia led by the Quds forces of the Revolutionary Guard of Iran uh, were moving towards an area called Deir Azor, which is where we, but we have a small presence there. Uh, the larger presence is with the YPG. The area is important to the Syrian regime because there's, it's the only area where they have oil. Uh, and because of our presence, we warned we have a, a regular liaison with the Russians. And we warn them this force is moving towards the, the YPG, moving towards where we have a presence, and they need to stop. And they didn't stop. And they kept coming. And not only did they not stop, but they opened fire uh, with tanks and artillery, which then triggered an American response where we wiped out the convoy. Now, in the convoy, it is reported that there were 200 Russian mercenaries. There's a group called Wagner that is a kind of, it's the equivalent of, uh, of what we had, I think, in, in Iraq. And, uh, you know, the Russians, first of all, the Russian government didn't admit it to begin with. Now, uh, as is usually the case, they said, well, you know, these were patriotic Russians who were volunteering. And, you know. But initially, they didn't admit it. Uh, now, they're, now, because there were enough notices within Russia of families who were coming out and saying it, They've had to acknowledge, well, there were, they said there were several dozen. They're still not admitting that there were 200. But so they were killed. Uh, Revolutionary Guard forces were killed. Uh, and the militias uh, were, you know, they, this, whole, this whole convoy was wiped out. Now, the interesting question is, so why didn't the Russians stop them? Uh, and it could well have been that, you know, uh, this is part of a probing to see, all right, what can you get away with? And so this is northeast Syria. Now, this was, a, this was a week ago Thursday. Two days later is when the Iranians sent a drone into Israel. Now, how do they do it? It's a stealth drone. They sent it over Jordan, and then they directed it into Israel. It was in Israeli airspace for 90 seconds before the Israelis had a helicopter shoot it down. But they obviously collected the remnants of it because one of the pieces... The Prime Minister of Israel held up when he was in Munich. He held up, you know, um, one of the uh, one of the remnants of the of the drone. Now, why do the Iranians do that? What's interesting about that is one thing about Iran. Typically, Iran works through indirection. You know, they use proxies. They don't tend to challenge the Israelis directly. They tend to do it through indirection. Uh, and um, and here, they too, much like what I think was a probe in Deir Ezzor, this was kind of probing to see, well, all right, what's the Israeli reaction? What's the nature of the Israeli intelligence? Can we get away with something later in the future? Maybe can we carry out an attack later in the future? Uh, so here you have what amounts to Russia and Turkey that have basically been getting along recently. Now there's a problem in the north. The Turks have basically said Assad has to go, but they stopped saying that and pretty much said, all right, as long as we can control the space in northern Syria, we're okay with it. Uh, the Iranians are trying basically to spread everywhere. The Iranians have brought in Shia militia from as far away as, as Pakistan and Afghanistan. How do they bring them in? There's about 20,000 of them that they brought into Syria. How do they bring them in from Afghanistan? Afghanistan's a pretty poor country, obviously has its own conflict going on. Shia don't do real well in Afghanistan, which is a Sunni country. Uh, and many Shia there want to acquire Iranian citizenship. How do they acquire it? The Iranians say, if you give us one or two of your sons for the militia, we'll give you citizenship, uh, and we'll pay them. So what you have is a kind of crazy quilt right now. Um, we say we have a policy. Uh, I'm still trying to understand it. Um, and the reason I put it that way is, you know, the, the main focus of the administration has been to defeat ISIS in Syria. It has not been uh, anti-Assad. It has not been anti-Iranian, even though the rhetoric of the administration when it comes to Iran is very tough across the board. And when Secretary Tillerson gave a speech, one of the reasons he said we were maintaining this uh, about a 2,000 personnel presence in northeast Syria uh, is because 
we haven't finished with ISIS, which is true, but also we, you know, we, we don't want the Iranians to fill the vacuum here, which would be good, except the Iranians are trying to fill the vacuum throughout the rest of Syria, and the Iranians are building a presence on the Israeli border, which I saw. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister of Israel has said that we're not going to allow the, the Iranians to embed themselves uh, in Syria. Well, you know, I was up in the Golan Heights, uh, and I saw you know, the local commander there pointed out to me, you could see it with your naked eye. Uh, there is a forward command post that has good forces in Hezbollah that is about three and a half miles away from the Israeli border. Uh, so, you know, they are embedding themselves in different places. And, and the question is, getting back to the heart of your question, the, the issue is, all right, what does it take to be able to try to bring about a political settlement uh, in Syria? The Russians have tried to run a parallel process in Sochi from the Geneva one. And again, just, just to, I mean, I want, I'll try not to go on too long, but once I get launched on this, it's hard to stop. The, the Russians and the United States, going back to the Obama administration, we came to a set of understandings first in 2011. Uh, it was a set of principles to produce a political transition uh, in uh, in Syria. This was done by Lavrov with Secretary Clinton. The only problem was the Russians never lived up to it. Then in, um, in November of 2015, after other uh, false starts, um, in Vienna, Secretary Kerry and Lavrov reached an agreement. Uh, and and that agreement was called the Vienna Principles, which one month later were embodied uh, in a resolution, Security Council Resolution 2254. Uh, and in that resolution, there was supposed to be an immediate cessation of hostilities. There was supposed to be uh, unencumbered, uninhibited uh, provision of humanitarian assistance to all the areas where there were sieges. One of the tactics of the Assad regime has been to put cities and towns and villages under siege, basically starve them, uh, deny them not just food but, but any medical um, if, if material. Uh, and so cessation of hostilities, provision unencumbered uh, of uh, humanitarian assistance, by the way, to 18 different places where there have been sieges, uh, and a political process of 18 months was to be launched with a, consti a new constitution to be drafted within six months. And the Russians didn't live up to that because they allowed Assad never to carry out the provision of the humanitarian assistance. Mm. There were three places out of the 18 where they allowed some to go through, but they took all the medical material off uh, the convoys that went in. So. You know, every agreement that's been reached, they haven't fulfilled. President Trump has met Putin twice each time he's issued a joint statement on Syria. The last one said, we, you know, we will have de-escalation zones. We recognize four de-escalation zones. Uh, there's one in the south, uh, north of the Jordanian border, and then there are three others. Now, two of the, you know, two of those four are the ones, if you just read the accounts of what's going on right now, the eastern Gouda area I, start, I mentioned before, and the Idlib province, these are places that can only be described as killing zones right now. Uh, 400,000 people in eastern Ghouta cut off from everything. Uh, and um, so it's not that we don't reach agreement with the Russians on this. And, it's, and the truth is, there can't be a political settlement without the Russians right now, because of their presence. Uh, but until they see, until Putin sees that uh, there will be a cost if you don't live up to what you agree to, uh, or there'll be a cost if he doesn't contain Iran. You know, I'm not saying it's too late to roll back the Iranians, but they shouldn't keep expanding their presence because they will produce a much wider war. You know, part of the problem that I have with the administration at this point is that they pretty much have left the Israelis on their own. For all, you know, it's, there's a lot of, this, this is an administration that embraces the Israelis rhetorically, maybe like no other administration. I mean, having written a book on that, 
went through every administration from Truman to Obama on this relationship, I can say, rhetorically, the embrace of the Israelis is probably like no other administration. But practically, you know, maybe the practicality will follow the rhetoric, but it hasn't yet. And one of the reasons, you know, what, what did the Israelis do um, when this drone came in? They didn't just shoot down the drone. So they, what they did is they went and they took out, there was a mobile van. I don't know, we don't have a map of Syria, but I'm going to describe something for you. The, the base from which this drone was launched is in an area actually where one of the, the most extraordinary set of ruins exists. It's called, the area is called it's Palmyra. Uh, and if you've ever been to the tombs in Egypt, the scope of the ruins in Palmyra actually is greater than what the tombs are. In any case, this is in central Syria. So this drone was, the command post was in a mobile van. It was launched from there, directed from there. The Israelis took out the mobile van. But they then took out three other command posts. So right now, the Iranians aren't in a position where they can launch any drones. Now, when they did that, one of the Israeli aircraft over Israeli airspace was hit by a barrage of surface-to-air missiles out of Syria, and the Israelis lost a plane for the first time since 1982. In response to that, the Israelis took out half of the Syrian air defense in 20 minutes. <coughs> now, and there were arguments made during the Obama administration, which I was a part of, saying we can't do anything because the air defense is just too difficult to contend with. The Israelis took out half of it, didn't lose the plane. The plane they lost was before. They, re they retaliated because of the fire against it. So th the point of all this is there needs to be a political settlement in Syria because the carnage is unconscionable. What we've seen in Syria should be a stain on the international conscience uh, and should be on ours. Uh, it needs to come to an end, but the Russians have the ability to pretty much contain the Iranians because the Russians have provided air cover for the Iranians and Shia militias. Uh, the, the, I don't expect the Russians to separate themselves from the Iranians, but they have the capacity to put enormous pressure on Assad and the Iranians because without the Russians, they don't have air cover. Uh, and the air cover is what allows them to expand. And if we were to say to them, look, if you don't stop that expansion, we will. Now, to put this in perspective, and then I'll stop so you can absorb all this. The Russians, the Russians changed the balance of power in Syria, cemented Assad's regime, uh, helped to pretty much roll back most of the opposition, although it's not all gone. And in fact, there'll be an insurgency for some time to come unless there is a serious effort at a political settlement. Uh, they did it with a fraction of the air power that we have, both in terms of numbers and in terms of quality. We fly stealth aircraft over Syria now that the Russians don't even see. So with a fraction of our air power, they completely transformed the balance of forces in Syria and cemented the Assad regime. They, they were on the ropes. Assad was on the ropes before the Russians intervened in the fall of 2015. So if we were to say, if you don't stop their expansion, we will, that would be credible. But the irony is if we were to say that, and if Putin believed it, if we say it but we don't follow up, you know, why will he believe it? Uh, we, we've threatened a lot of things, you know, <laughs> that we haven't followed through on in the Obama administration with him, and, uh, and this one actually doesn't threaten the Russians. That's a different issue. Um, but Putin wants to be seen as the arbiter of events. It's one of the reasons that the Russians are there. So if it looked like American power was going to be an arbiter of events, that would also motivate him. But if it doesn't motivate him, you know, what we did a week ago Thursday shows what we can do. We didn't initiate it. We responded only after attack. Now, if we were to say, okay, we're not rolling them back, but stop the expansion, because if you don't stop the expansion, there's going to be a much wider war. When I said the Israelis have been left on their own, the way the Israelis signal is not with words. When they're left on their own, they signal with force. Uh, and my guess is we haven't seen the end of this unless the Russians decide that this becomes too risky for them. There's two ways for that to happen. One is they decide that this is going to escalate and they're in the middle of it. The other is they hear from us the things that they haven't heard from us, but I think they should hear from us. So given the players, 
given the Russian role and the desire to be arbiter, given the Turkish role, given the Iranian war role, when there is a peace, who takes this, who shapes sort of post-Syria conflict Levant? And what are the interests of Russia in that event? What are the interests of Iran? I think you've, you've, you've addressed that. What are our interests? Look, I think the Russian interest is primarily um, to be seen as an arbiter of events, but also to, to have what even the Soviets didn't have. They now have an air base in Syria that the Soviet Union never had. They have been, they, their Tartus was a, a port of call for them. It was a kind of naval support facility, but not a base. It's being transformed into a base now. So in terms of the projection of power, in terms of giving the Russians much greater weight in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Putin wants to be there. So his interest is both to be seen as, first of all, bringing the conflict to an end. By the way, he has an interest in bringing it to an end. He has an interest in bringing it to an end because the fact is they do have people on the ground there. They are not keen on admitting that they take casualties. Uh, so, you know, they have an interest in finding a way to have this, what is a lower level of insurgency brought to an end. Look, week before last, they lost a plane. So they don't, you know, we can play a role here uh, in terms of saying we'll do our part, you know, to, you know, to limit and, and lean on those who might be providing material to those who would continue to the fight. We can do that. But it can't be we're the only ones who do that. You know, in the, during the effort at a cessation of hostilities, we were the only one doing that. The Russians weren't doing it. So it has to be a two-way street. But so the first thing is they have an interest in, in ending the conflict. We have an interest in ending the conflict for moral reasons, if nothing else, uh, but also because the longer it goes on, the greater the risk that it will turn into something wider. What you've seen between the Israelis and the Iranians, you know, a week ago Saturday, is a harbinger of, of much worse things to come. In part, when it looked, the Israelis, what are the... These, when the Israelis lay down red lines, they actually act on them. Now, they've laid down the following red lines. One, no Iranian air base or naval base uh, in Syria. Two, no expansion of a military infrastructure that creates a kind of permanence for the Shia militias. By the way, the leaders of Shia militias uh, from Iraq have, have come to the border with Israel to say that they'll be, they'll be involved in the next fight. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a second for the Israelis. Don't build up a kind of military facilities that give these Shia militias a kind of permanence. The third thing is they can't fabricate, either in Syria or Lebanon, uh, what are factories that would produce advanced guidance systems on the rockets that the Iranians have provided uh, to the Syrians, but also to the Lebanese, meaning to Hezbollah. 120,000 rockets that they provided to Hezbollah, but they're not accurate. If they become accurate, Israel is in a, a very different world. Israel is a small country with a very small, limited set of strategic, high value strategic targets and infrastructure economically. So when Israel says they won't tolerate that, they really won't tolerate that. Uh, now here again, the Russians should have an interest in want, wanting to see that. We have an interest in not wanting to see that. Uh, so as I said, no one, well, the Iranians, one of the reasons the Iranians are there is the only place they've successfully exported their revolution was in Lebanon with Hezbollah. And so they've created now what is not just an air bridge, but a land bridge through Iraq, through Syria, into Lebanon, to Hezbollah. Well, th that's not going to be undone. And I'm not saying it should be undone. What I am saying is what they have, okay, but no more, because we're not going to see this thing limited. Turkey, in the end, also doesn't want to see the Iranians embed themselves more uh, within Syria. Turkey and Iran have this kind of interesting more competitive than cooperative relationship. They will cooperate on some things, but most of the time they compete. Mm -hmm. And part of it is they both see themselves having a larger 
role in the Middle East and having a right to a larger role in the Middle East. So you, you have these different actors um, from a strategic standpoint. What Turkey wants in Syria is geared almost entirely against ensuring that the Kurds can't create a kind of platform there that could be a threat to Turkey. Uh, and some kind of, we talk about an outcome of a unified Syria. I don't think you can produce a unified Syria that is, uh, that is centrally run out of Damascus. I think you could recreate, you could have a unified Syria that is highly decentralized. First of all, even now, even at this point, the Syrian regime's writ extends to about half the country. Uh, and there are large parts of the country that are, you know, are the, the rule is entirely local. And the reconstruction could be managed in a way and needs to be managed because if you don't, and part of the problem is if you don't, you, you need to do four things in Syria in terms of not just a political settlement. If you don't want a vacuum to be created that ends up being filled ultimately by the next incarnation of ISIS, you need reconstruction, uh, you need security, you need inclusion, meaning not political exclusion, inclusion, and you need decent governance. And that won't happen overnight. You need the Gulf states to provide a lot of the money for this. Uh, but you need a context, you need a political context where this can take place. We can play a major role in this. Uh, Are we likely to? It's an excellent question. I hope we will. I mean, at this point, um, I would like to see a greater integration of the diplomacy with a, with a coercive element and with the ability to draw in the reconstruction funds. I'll give you what would produce the reconstruction funds. Because, you know, just to give you an example, so we, we held this, Secretary Tillerson went to Kuwait for this meeting on reconstruction for, um, for Iraq. And the Iraqis put out in advance they needed $88 billion uh, for reconstruction. The Kuwaitis at the end of the meeting said there was $30 billion that was pledged. It was clearly new math yeah. because it didn't come close to adding up to $30 billion. And by the way, almost none of it was grants. Uh, and, um, you know, here I would say for us to be able to mobilize the Gulf states to do more, they have to see that we're dealing with what, is, what they see as the biggest threat to them, which is the Iranians. If we could contain them the way I was describing in Syria, then we could go to the Gulf states and we could say, all right, look, we've done this. We've taken care of what you're most concerned about. Now, this is what we require from you, because if you don't provide the monies for reconstruction, we're going to be dealing with son of ISIS. But taking care of it would mean pressing the Russians to deny the airspace to, right, to, to contain them. Is that, is that the steps it's that taking, would be taking it, taking it requires the Russians to say to the Iranians, where you are is fine, no further. And if you, if you go further, we won't provide you any air cover. Okay. The minute they do that, the Iranians may still test it, but that's the moment at which they become much more vulnerable. Now, we are very much engaged already in the, in the kind of Saudi-Iranian uh, tug of war right. in that competition. A dramatic example being Yemen, the war in Yemen, yeah. where we're, on the, we're, we're alongside the Saudi-led coalition. Talk about what our interests are in, in Yemen, um, how that war, which is uh, horrific as well, uh, you know, famine, cholera. looks like cholera outbreaks, yeah. um, you know, folks really trapped in ungodly circumstances. Um, what are our interests, and how does this thing get wound down? You know, it's... And how many crises can you handle at once? Well, that's, I was, you know... <laughs> One of the ironies right now is, as bad as the Middle East has looked in the past, and as terrible as some of the wars have been, I mean, there was an eight and a half year war between Iraq and Iran. There was a million casualties. Uh, you've had four Arab-Israeli wars. Uh, but all that pales compared to what you're seeing in the region right now. Because you have these 
what amounts to two proxy wars, although, as I said, Syria has become a more complicated landscape than even a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but Yemen is purely a proxy war. Uh, you know, you've got a, you have a struggle in, in Sinai, uh, you have Libya, uh, you have Iran active almost, you know, uh, in a variety of places, in Iraq, uh, smuggling stuff into Bahrain, in Syria, in Yemen. Um, the Iranians in Yemen basically see it as a cheap way to bleed the Saudis. Mm -hmm. The Saudis see the Houthis as being an Iranian effort to create Hezbollah on their border. And by the way, Hezbollah is there, helping to fire rockets into Saudi Arabia. The Saudis uh, have, you know, the bombing has contributed to what is a humanitarian catastrophe. It's true. The numbers, you, the, the mer numbers of dead pale compared to Syria. But right now, there are two million kids who are probably malnourished uh, in Yemen. Uh, the Saudis now are trying to do much more to try to ease what is the, uh, the humanitarian situation. But you already took what is the po one of the poorest countries in the Middle East, probably the one country on the planet that is likely to run out of water sooner than any other. Uh, I mean, it's just, you're talking about a place that was already impoverished and you've, and it's just, it's been devastated. So, all right, so what are, one interest is again, just at a humanitarian level. It's, you know, to think that somehow we aren't all diminished when these kinds of catastrophes from a human standpoint uh, are allowed to go on and, you know, basically the world goes through the motions of trying to deal with them. Uh, you know, it, it does affect all of us. Uh, it breaks down, you know, when, you, when the rules of basic humanity break down, it means more and more of this can take place. So if you ask me, for me, that's the real driving interest. Uh, there's a strategic interest because the, there's a strait, you know, about 30% of the world's oil passes through this strait. If you close this down, it will have an economic consequence. You know, the Babno Mandeb, this is where the, this is an area that, you know, if the war expanded, you could affect that. For me, that's not the driving purpose. The driving purpose is to stop what is happening and is, again, is unconscionable. So what can be done to stop it? Um, First, there are two Security Council resolutions that the Iranians are violating right now by providing arms to the Houthis. Uh, now, some of the arms they provide is not over, it's, it's overland through Oman. Uh, and more could be done to stop that. We should be leaning on the Omani government to do more. Uh, we could actually, we, given the two Security Council resolutions, we could, expect, we could inspect all ships. Uh, that would be one way to cut off this material that's going in. And we should probably do that. Um, the question is, can you produce some kind of political settlement? You know, it's, it's difficult because, you know, the Houthis, when they, when they rebelled against the existing, and to go back, uh, the guy who had run Yemen for 30 years uh, was, in the end, someone who was forced out by, during the, to quote the Arab Spring. Uh, he didn't go real willingly, but he, he left and then he came back. Uh, and he teamed with the Houthis to remove the government that had replaced him, that had been the product of the, the work of the Gulf Cooperation Council. And uh, the, the Houthis, um, you know, at one time, they are, they are a Shia offshoot. Uh, they have a connection with the Iranians. They're not the equivalent of Hezbollah. Because Hezbollah was really, interesting enough, was a creation of the Revolutionary Guard uh, in, the, in, 1980, in 1982 <coughs> during the war with Israel. The Houthis are not a creation of the Revolutionary Guard. They're not a creation of the Iranians, but they have a connection to them. And the Iranians see it as, as I said, an easy way to bleed the Saudis. The Houthis are really good at fighting. They're not really good at governing. 
there are some splits within the Houthis, and there are tribes that could be, I think, coalesced. The, the focus, I think, needs to be on trying to put more international attention on it and coming out with some public plan for uh, a ceasefire and a negotiating process where you shine enough attention on this that it become, you begin to raise the costs to those parties there of not responding to what you're doing internationally. Uh, I think you know, we, you know, we certainly could work with the Saudis that way, but we could put, I think, uh, a shine a spotlight on even on the Iranians. So the Iranians also have a stake in saying, oh, look, we're supporting, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not opposing this. You have the foreign minister of Iran who likes to go around and says, look, we're, we're about stability in the region. Well, all right, prove it. Challenge him in a public way. Uh, I mean, you asked. This is Zarif here referring yeah, to. Yeah. You asked me before, are we, you know, can we do what I was suggesting in Syria? You know, we have got to find a way to, to uh, be more active diplomatically, but in a way that also seems credible. You know, one thing that builds credibility is get something done. So you've just come back from Saudi Arabia. I have. Um, and the person we most associate with the war in Yemen is the crown prince, is Mohammed bin Salman. Um, he's seen by some as just somebody who's consolidating power when he arrested all the princes and put them in the Ritz um, on, on a claim of corruption. Yep. Um, and he's seen by others as a reformer who is trying to, is worried about unemployment of young people, particularly with oil not being what it once was for them, um, trying to bring them into a, a more integrated economy with skills that, that, that are relevant today. Um, but that also that he sort of rein in some of the more extremist kind of language and, and theology that are, or ideology that comes yep. out of Wahhabis. What is, what is your view of him? What is your view of the future that he'll be part of in Saudi Arabia? Um, my view of him is he's actually a revolutionary. He's carrying out a revolution from above. I've been there, I've been to Saudi Arabia twice since he, um, he really came to power. Uh, and what I'm struck by is that uh, the change that he's trying to engineer from above is being driven by his understanding that the kingdom, the family, doesn't survive without change. Mm. Uh, I think he read it before he came to power. He created something called the Misk Foundation five years ago at a time when his father was the governor of Riyadh, but he, he had no real role. He, Mohammed bin Salman, had no real role. Uh, and this was about youth empowerment. It was about building a knowledge-based society. Uh, he brought in uh, uh, young women who had been educated uh, mostly in the States to run it. Uh, and um, what you find when you go to Saudi Arabia now is that I think he understood something, not just about you know, the, the difficulties of, su of sustaining what was the kind of compact that existed, which was for a long time basically a deal between the royal family and the clerics. Uh, where the royal family got to run the country uh, and the clerics basically got to run the education and, and finance uh, madrasas around the world and, and fuel Wahhabism, which is a very austere and tolerant form uh, of Islam. Uh, and, uh, and that was the deal. And the deal with us, historically, was you provide the oil, we'll provide your security. Uh, and I think that he looked at this and said, you know, <laughs> we're not going to have $100 of oil forever. 70% uh, of our population is under the age of 30. They are increasingly arrestive. Uh, 2011 came along and you saw the arrestiveness in the rest of the region. I think he took a lesson from that. Uh, and I think he decided we've got to, we have to tap it or we won't make it. And so, you know, when I, just to give you, I'll give you some examples of things that I've, I've seen when I've been there. Um, I went to a, a place called King Abdullah City, which is uh, on the Red Sea. It's a planned city, and I went to the College of Entrepreneurship, and I met with a co-ed group. 
first I'm underscoring the word co-ed group. Uh, and they were all like in their late 20s and their level of enthusiasm was like, you know, you couldn't contain it. You couldn't fake it. And their sense was they, you know, they were going to remake the country. And they feel they, they have the right to do it. I had on this most recent trip, I had dinner with two 30-year-olds, which is not a big deal when two-thirds of the population, 70% is, is under the age of 30. Um, one had just finished an advanced degree, could have stayed here, uh, did an advanced degree at the University of Kansas, and come back because he wants to be a part of it. Uh, the guy who was running the IPO, uh, Mohammed Al-Sheikh, an IPO for Aramco, they're, they're, they're taking 5% of Aramco public. Now think about what that means. This is a Saudi national oil company. You're taking it public. What it means is it can no longer be the private piggy bank of the royal family. You have to have a kind of transparency. Uh, you know, it's not just that they're, they're opening cinemas now. They, you know, women are now allowed to go to soccer matches. And, and I was watching several being interviewed. And you couldn't, con they, they, their happiness, you couldn't, again, it was just, it was, they were exuding it. You know, every younger person I met felt they own the change. This change is not being produced because the outside world wants it. It's being produced because they think they're driving it. Uh, you know, Six Flag America is going to Saudi Arabia and is going to be co-ed. You know, they're building a tourist area on the a, a new city uh, on the Red Sea. Uh, and again, the social mores will go, that will be the same as they would be any place in the world. The power of the religious police has been taken away. They used to be able to interrogate, detain, and arrest. Uh, they would go into the malls and, you know, and, you know harass uh, mixed couples. It's been taken away. They can't do it. Uh, now, am I saying, and, you know, they've made a decision, women can drive. Uh, they're now dealing, with, you're, you're, they've come out and said women don't have to wear long robes. The issue of guardianship, you know, women couldn't travel abroad unless they had the approval of their husband or a male relative. Apparently, they're, they're about to take that on. So what you're seeing, you know, this is, I've been going to Saudi Arabia since 1991, and it's a different country. Now, am I certain it's going to succeed? No. Uh, first, revolutions from above, you know, when you, when you get used to an authoritarian way of doing business, it's hard to break the habit. Uh, and, you know, uh, I wrote a piece in the Washington Post after I came back sort of uh, outlining all the positives and why I think we have an enormous stake in this. And let me explain that, and then I'm going to also say what I said about some of the areas of concerns. Uh, there has never been a successful model of development in the Arab Middle East. And because of that, because of terrible governance, because of lagging behind, because of gross inequalities, you know, you've had pretenders who were going to be the ones who produced progress, you know, who were going to be the ones who produced justice. You know, this is a region you know, that led the, led the world in the 10th century. And there's a longing in this region for greatness lost. There's also a longing for fairness and justice. And from, from the secular Nasser's like Nasser, claimed they would be the ones who would, you know, they would be the ones who would deliver. He described himself as a role in search of a hero, and he was going to be the hero. The secular nationalists tried and failed. Saddam Hussein was like that. But the Islamists, that's what they're doing. This is the Muslim Brotherhood. When they ran in Egypt, they said Islam is the answer. Islam is a solution. Uh, what, is, what was ISIS saying? You know, they were going to perfect Islam and perfect the society. So they've all made these grandiose claims precisely because there's this need. There's this hunger. There's this vacuum because there hasn't been a, a successful model of development, at least in the larger countries. So we have a stake in them succeeding. Uh, now the question is, will they? Well, a couple things. They need, as I said, over time, the, uh, it, it was probably true you couldn't carry out this revolution except from above. And it's great that you're seeing from the bottom up, you're seeing this level of enthusiasm. But you can't do everything by fiat. You want to build a knowledge-based society? OK, you've got to create the space for people to be, to be able to operate. You know, that means, and I wrote this, you don't jail 
bloggers and journalists. Uh, okay, you, you wanted to deal with corruption, which is a legitimate issue. It was a way of doing business there for a long time. Uh, and, you know, okay, there's a lot of people you, you put at the Ritz, uh, and m many have been released, and many have obviously committed significant resources to the government as a result. Uh, but if you want foreign investment, then there has to be transparency and a rule of law. And those who, if you're going to generate foreign investment, and I know he wants it, they have to have a level of confidence that, you know, if they're going to invest in something, that it can't be arbitrarily taken away. So, and then one other thing, I, and this I'd like, and here I'd say it's a two-way street. I would like us, and I, again, it's, you, it gets back to the question you asked, or can we do it? But I would like us to have a senior policy channel uh, where we mutually, with the Saudis, discuss and think through uh, big decisions before they're taken. You know, I'll give you an example on our side, I'll give you a couple of examples on their side. Um, the decision to declare Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. You know, if we had if we had gone to the Saudis beforehand and said, we're going to do this, but before we do it, because look, the fact is, uh, some significant part of Jerusalem is always going to be Israel's capital. That's just a fact. But to declare it, we realize we want you to be part of a peace plan we're going to, to unveil. We realize you need to have a political space so that you can be responsive to us. And if we do this, in a way without taking into account some of your concerns or without framing this in a way that at least gives you an explanation, that's going to be really hard to do. So maybe if we'd gone to them a couple of months before, we could have, the administration could have made the decision anyway, but done it in a way that would have been less disruptive to what they themselves say they want to present. In fact, they said this only yesterday that they wanted to present this. So that could have been something that, that uh, would have been played out in this kind of a mutual channel, but I would say the, uh, the, the boycott or embargo of Qatar, the, um, what was done with Rafiq uh, Saeed uh, um, Hariri, his son, um, you know, in Lebanon, meaning that he was, he went for a visit in Saudi Arabia and stayed longer perhaps than he intended yes. uh, or desired. Uh, and the purpose was, I mean, in each case, both with Qatar and with Lebanon, what the Saudis had in mind, by the way, was not necessarily wrong, meaning their objective was not necessarily wrong. But they didn't produce the objective, and the objective was a shared one. Look, Qatar plays a double game. You know, they, they allow us, they pay for this huge base we have, and then they create a platform you know, for the very ideology, uh, they give credence to the very ideology in Al Jazeera uh, that we end up having to fight. So we had a shared interest in affecting what Qatar does in that regard, but doing it this way actually has driven them closer to the Iranians, yeah. hasn't changed any of their behavior. Uh, so since we share the same objectives, you know, in Lebanon, not what, what the Saudis were concerned about, that Said Hariri gives a veneer of legitimacy to what Hezbollah is doing there. So since we share the same objectives, let's talk through what might be a, uh, you know, a division of labor between us for actually trying to achieve those objectives. So having that kind of a, a serious high-level uh, dialogue but channel before big decisions are taken where you think through, here's what we're thinking about doing does it make sense? Or what could we do differently to make it no, more likely? We didn't even tell our embassies until a few hours before. Right. So, yeah. No, but that's, that's your point yeah. about are we, <laughs> can we do so, it? So we've actually made it 50 minutes with Dennis Ross without talking about Israel-Palestine. You, 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 so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn us to that because you wrote an article um, uh, saying, you know, here's how or, or the Trump administration should get the peace talks back on, on track. What would that look like? Um, basically, I think what uh, it would look like is the following. First, you have to contend with the fact that um, 
you're dealing with a level of disbelief on each side that is so profound that to think that you can suddenly snap your fingers and it's all going to be resolved uh, is an illusion. It doesn't mean that coming with a plan that deals with principles that go to the heart of the conflict uh, might not be the way to go, but it means it has to be prepared. Just like what I was saying, you make a decision declaring that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, that's okay provided you prepare the ground for it. The same with this peace plan that's going to be prepared. You know, it's going to have to cross the threshold of credibility with both sides. Now, what, what uh, Jared Kushner and, and Jason Greenblatt were reported to have told the Security Council members yesterday was that this plan, when they come with it, you know, the Israelis are going to love part of it and hate part of it. The Arabs are going to love part of it and hate part of it. Uh, well, before you come with it, you need to know actually how each side is actually going to respond. Uh, and certainly, if you want the Arabs to embrace it, the, the level of Arab support isn't that they tell you in private they'll support it. If they tell you in private they'll support it and do nothing in public, you have achieved zero. You know, what you need to do is you need to orchestrate with them a script. You need to write out the script. You have to have, you know, and here again it goes back. The more they see, meaning the Gulf states in particular, that we're dealing credibly with the threats that they're concerned about, not, not by rolling them back, because we're not going to do that, but by stopping them, containing them, uh, the more you can ask not only for reconstruction, you can say, all right, look, we need your help on this too. And this is what we expect of you. Now, lay out exactly what you want them to say in public. And it shouldn't just be the Saudis. It should be the Egyptians, Jordanians, Saudis, Emiratis, maybe the Moroccans as well. Uh, that you work out in advance exactly what they're going to say in response to the, the plan you're presenting. But you need to do something even before that. The level of disbelief is so great that you've got to do something on the ground. The problem with peacemaking is it can't be only top-down. It has to be bottom-up as well. Uh, and ironically, I would start in Gaza. Because if you don't do something in Gaza soon, Gaza is going to blow up. You know, you have Tremendous four to suffering there as well. Yes, you have four to six hours a day of, of electricity. Ninety-six percent of the water in Gaza is undrinkable. Uh, two more years and you won't even be able to recover it. There is, because of the lack of electricity, the sewage treatment plants don't operate. Uh, so, you know, think about what it would be to have four to six hours of electricity a day. Uh, the Israelis were providing 1,000 trucks a day to provide material into Gaza. Those are down to about 300. Why? Because there's no money to buy anything. I mean, the place is deteriorating, uh, and the place to start with doing something is first prevent that from blowing up. Uh, and you can. You could. It is not that difficult. I mean, it takes a level of effort. And you could get, you know, Hamas, I think, at this point will not resist it. And you can have, you can create a kind of oversight for all the delivery of what needs to be done. Uh, so much of what needs to be done in terms of electricity doesn't have to, and water doesn't have to wait for desalinization. You can do the sewage treatment plants using uh, a small amount of solar panels and solar fields, which cost really very little. I mean, this is actually the Arava Institute has produced, uh, has a proposal that for $12 million you could take care of all the sewage treatment in Gaza. $500 million for a desalinization plant, $12 million for sewage treatment, which means water treatment. Uh, and deal with that first, organize that. This is something the administration could organize with the Norwegians who had the ad hoc liaison committee, which is a donors committee that was established back in my time, uh, meaning right after Oslo 1993, uh, and do something there first. Because if you do something on the ground first, it sends a signal that you're serious. Mm -hmm. And it gives everybody a reason to pay attention and say, you know what, well, maybe something can be done. The problem with launching this big plan before you've shown you actually can produce anything is that there's a very high likelihood that no one will take it seriously. Yeah. And, and how do we think about um, the, the politics of Mahmoud Abbas accepting uh, a plan from us? Because the Jerusalem decision surely weakened right. him. Uh, 
um, and Netanyahu's uh, position too. He's surely weakened it at least a little by the by the corruption scandal around him. That's got to have helped. Had, had a big impact on him politically as well. So talk about the politics for each side, right. uh, regardless of the content of that deal. Right. Um, yeah, wouldn't it be great if we just had a laboratory where we could just present these things and you wouldn't have to worry about the political context? Um, look, the I'll deal with each of them in turn. Let me start with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. He's made it clear he won't respond to anything that comes from the United States right now. But that's all the more reason why you actually have to have the Arabs. Mm -hmm. If, now again, and to do that, you have to cross the threshold of credibility. You know, I was, when I was in Saudi Arabia, I, I asked the question, the senior official there, I said, what does it take for you to embrace um, the peace plan that the Trump administration is putting together? And he says, well, we can support it. And I said, no, I mean publicly. And he basically says, well, it has to be credible. I said, so give me your definition of credible. And he said, what you wrote. Well, what he meant by that, the Clinton parameters, and that would be credible. Meaning, when it comes to borders, when, you know, for, for Jerusalem, you have to have two capitals. The borders will be, you know, they're basically 67 and mutually swaps, which means June 4, 67 is not the default border. It means you end up with block areas that are probably 4 to 5 percent of the West Bank, and then you compensate mm -hmm. for that with the, with the Palestinians. Um, you end up, you know, the, the way you deal with refugees is to allow them to return to the Palestinian state, but not to Israel. You can have some humanitarian uh, rubric that allows uh, some to come back who are old or uh, some limited family reunification, but it still has to be something the Israelis would permit, and it can't be, uh, it can't be a demand. Uh, and the security, the rubric for security will have to be, the withdrawal for me has always been, it, it shouldn't, it needs to be governed by a set of performance criteria, meaning that the, the character, the, the withdrawal will be carried out maybe with target dates, but that, as Yitzhak Rabin once said, there are no sacred dates. What he meant by that is, you know, what has to be established is real. And in this sense, if the Israelis are getting out, the argument, well, they can always go back in, that's a terrible argument. Mm. You don't build an agreement that's based on the probability of failure. And you also don't build an agreement that makes another failed state likely. So there needs to be institution building, there needs to be performance criteria, now, all that needs to be part of this. Uh, but in a sense, you know, what I was hearing was if it, if it reflects that kind of an approach, then they can embrace it. If it doesn't reflect that kind of an approach, they're, they're not going to do it. And there's a reason they'll embrace it, because one of the things they want to be able to say, they are able to deliver for the Palestinians what they cannot deliver for themselves. So if you had the Arab states embrace it because it was credible, and if you orchestrated it with them privately, you worked out a script in advance, and then you go to the Europeans and you say, look, this is, this is what the Arabs are prepared to embrace, the odds are you then have the Europeans as well, then it's, it's almost impossible for Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, to say no to it. And again, one of the reasons is, if you ask Palestinians what's the one thing that they have achieved, they will tell you the fact that the international <coughs> community embraces the legitimacy of our cause. If it looks like they're putting that at risk, it makes it very hard not to respond. All right, so I did one side of the political equation, but I didn't do the other side. Um, obviously, in the current circumstances in Israel, uh, the right within this government has more leverage. Having said that, when I said earlier about President Trump and this administration, that at least rhetorically what they've done uh, is embrace the Israelis the way no one else has, makes it really hard for any Israeli government to then oppose this administration, especially after the Prime Minister of Israel has built up the presence yeah. so high. So now when he's, he says, look, this is a guy who really takes Israel's concerns into account, and then his administration comes with a plan, 
Are you then going to oppose it? I don't think it's so easy to oppose it. So, you know, here, if you came here fully depressed and the first part of the conversation <laughs> left you even more depressed, <laughs> now what I'm suggesting to you is that it, it may not be hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we're going to end the radio portion of this show, so please join me in thanking Dennis Ross.